Guten Morgen. Bom dia. Bonjour. Yadra. Buongiorno. Buenos dias. Sabahul Heri. Kalimera. Good morning and welcome to Beauty Unlocked. Something appropriate for us as a message. Um, the only song I can really kind of think of. Welcome, friends, to a brand new episode of Beauty Unlocked. <laughs> Do you know? You know when you're nervous and you start sweating profusely? I mean, apart from the fact that it's hot here in Cyprus and you're trying something new and you're like, oh, God, is this going to work out? Is this going <laughs> to? I probably butchered saying good morning in different languages and people are probably listening and thinking, just stick to the English, bitch. You're already butchering that. <laughs> just stick to the English. <laughs> Do I at least get an A for effort? I'll settle for like an A minus for effort. Saying good morning, especially, well, I definitely butchered the German. You know what? I butchered it all. Like in all honesty, and just saying good morning in Arabic, I must have... I don't even know if that's proper. I'm hoping it is. Um, no disrespect, in all honesty. I listened like to playback of Good Morning in Arabic over 50 times, and I probably still butchered it. So to those that are listening that speak Arabic, please let me know. Send me feedback. Tell me how shitty the Good Morning I just said in Arabic was, because <laughs> I'm sure I butchered it so badly. But I tried. A minus. I'll take an A minus for effort, please. Please. So you're all wondering why the hell did she say good morning in different languages? And it was actually to make reference of um, old episodes. Um, remember the Yadra in Fiji? Yes. Um, I was going to go either for Yadra or Bula, but Bula, as we as we talked about, is like a general greeting, whereas Yadra is used more in the morning. And um, and well, it was also as a, <laughs> as a massive thank you, although I'm not too sure if it was a massive thank you to all those listening. Those are just some of the countries actually who, who um, listen to Beauty Unlocked. Um, Fiji, not yet. But again, it was just a, an homage to like, you know, a previous episode that we did on Fiji. But um, I, I'm shocked at uh, the countries that do listen um do have germany i have portugal i have the netherlands i've got australia singapore india um the united states uh, uh, cyprus uh palestine yes palestine um oh god I, I went blank on where else france i don't know um they're probably those that were listening in france were probably thinking well you just seriously gave it all in your Sarah Bartman episode in insulting the French. Um, but yeah, thank you, France, for listening. We have the UK. Uh, we've got Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, we have uh, England, uh, Ireland itself also listening. So um, we're, we're, we're all over the place. And I just wanted to say a thank you by saying good morning in those languages. And I probably butchered, butchered it. Um, so I'm so sorry about that. But um, y you can't, I mean, you got to try things in life, right? So I hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode on manjectification, the objectification of men. And I hope you guys got to see it from another point of view that it really isn't balancing the scales when we objectify men. Um, because, well, you know, men do also have feelings and it's, it's unfair to have certain expectations of the perfect body and even though... I've, I've had conversations where many people say or many women say, well, you know, it's kind of like an eye for an eye, isn't it? And it's like, yeah, but does it really balance it out? Or is it just that, you know, we live in a pretty, you know, it's still sexism, isn't it? And so um, I hope you guys enjoyed that that episode. Before we get started on this week's 
intriguing episode. It is actually quite intriguing. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of, I know it's a bit late to do spring cleaning, but we're going to do some spring cleaning. It's been a while since I've actually done some spring cleaning at the beginning of the show. Um, so just a friendly reminder. We see that the Instagram family is growing. So if you have Instagram, follow us. Give us a follow at Beauty Unlocked Podcast. I almost, I, I drew a blank there. I was like, wait, what is it? I, I get a little bit confused. <laughs> it's not my fault. Uh, so it's Beauty Unlocked Podcast. Don't forget to also follow us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. You can find us at Beauty Unlocked, the podcast. And also don't forget to send me emails, you guys. I want to know what you think of the show, your opinions, any show ideas, anything that you want to listen to. Um, you want me to rant and rave about a particular topic. Send us an email at beautyunlockedpodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Ooh, and just a, a friendly reminder, a gentle nudge that if you do listen to the show on iTunes, rate us, review us, spread some of that sweet, sweet love. You know, I'm all about that sweet, sweet love, babies. And I promise this is the last, last bit of spring cleaning. Um, you can find us on Patreon. If you want to become a patron of the Patreon, just head on over to patreon.com forward slash beauty unlocked and check out the tiers and see what uh, what you get, what perks you get um, by signing up to the Patreon. All right. So are you ready? So as I mentioned in the beginning, we have listeners around the world and one of those places is Australia. And I was like, "Ooh, Australia. Mm -mm -mm. So you have tons of talent that comes from there and i'm not gonna name names i'm not gonna mention names because you know you guys know you all know um who comes from australia um but australia i was like mm, fascinating absolutely fascinating so i was thinking what could i do on australia and i started searching and i was looking and i came across a few articles about the beauty standards the beauty ideals it kind of was regurgitating the same the same stuff over and over again, the Western beauty ideals. And I was like, mm, I really don't feel like talking about that because we talk about it so much, obviously. And I was like, let me take it from another angle. And this is where I came and fell on a few articles that I seriously found really, really interesting. I need to, like, expand my fucking vocabulary, I think. <laughs> We're going to take a look at two talented women who are shining a light and reshaping perceptions of Australia's indigenous population. And this is a term that's used very broadly. Um, but before we get into their stories, we're actually going to take a look at the First Peoples of Australia. If you're anything like me, you know Australia's geographical location. You know some some famous names that come from there. You might know the politics of Australia, um, that it's a continent. I mean, we can go on and, and on about the general information um, of Australia, but we're going to definitely dive deeper and find out more about the first peoples of Australia. So the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues estimates there are more than 370 million indigenous peoples spread across 70 countries worldwide. Now that, I did not know. Each practicing unique traditions retaining social, cultural, economic, and political characteristics that are distinct from those of the dominant societies in which they live. So many indigenous peoples are the holders of unique languages, knowledge systems, and beliefs, and possess invaluable traditional knowledge for the sustainable management of natural resources and have a special relation to and use of their traditional land, waters, or territories, which apparently us motherfuckers here want to destroy for some reason. Huh. Ancestral lands, waters, and territories are of fundamental importance for their physical and cultural survival as peoples. And they're constantly under threat. That's just me that's adding that. In considering the diversity of indigenous peoples, an official definition of indigenous has not been adopted by any UN system or body. So according to the UN, the most fruitful appro approach is to identify rather than define indigenous peoples. 
This is based on the fundamental criterion of self-identification as underlined in a number of human rights documents. So Australia has two distinct cultural groups made up of Aboriginal, with a capital A, and Torres Strait Islander peoples. But there is great diversity within these two broadly described groups, um, and this is exemplified by the over 250 different language groups spread across the nation. So let's look at the terms. So which terms to use, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, let's check it out. So First People is a collective name for the original people of Australia and their descendants. And this is an acceptable term to be used. But many people prefer to be called Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander rather than the generic term Indigenous Australian. It's always best to find out what individuals prefer to be called rather than making assumptions because us as human beings we make immediate assumptions and that is technically wrong um, so it's best to always find out what individuals prefer to be called today the term indigenous Australian is used to encompass both Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people however many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do not like to be referred to as indigenous as the term is considered too generic so when used in Australia, the words indigenous, aboriginal, and Torres Strait Islander are capitalized, as would be the name of any other group of people. It is best not to resort to the acronyms of ATSI or TSI, as this is considered to be offensive. The lowercase word aboriginal refers to an indigenous person from any part of the world, and it doesn't necessarily refer to an aboriginal Australian. Uh, and as previously mentioned, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander should always be capitalized. So the term Aborigen has negative connotations and should be avoided. And this goes back to the colonization of Australia. So the term Aborigen has negative connotations. Aboriginal people have referred to themselves, for example, as, and I'm so sorry if, again, I, I don't pronounce this well, um, so they refer to themselves as the Kori, Mori, or Nunga, which is relevant to the greater region they are connected to. Aboriginal identities can also directly link to their language groups and traditional count, uh, country. So this is a specific geographic location. So for example, Gunditjamara people are the traditional custodians of Western Victoria. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation are from Sydney, and the ya, uh, Yaoru people are the traditional custodians of Brum in Western Australia. So the Mori is usually used by Aboriginal people in and from Queensland and Northwest New South Wales. I'm actually having this picture in my head of Australia, and I'm like, okay, I'm trying to place everything. The Gori is usually used by Aboriginal people in and from northern New South Wales um, coastal regions. And the Kori is usually used by Aboriginal people in and from parts of New South Wales and Victoria. So another way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people might describe themselves, which again relates to their country, and this is including the waters, they um, might refer to themselves as saltwater people, for those who live on the coast or freshwater, rainforest, desert, or spinifex for people who live in the ecological environment. Now the Torres Strait Islander people prefer to use the name of their home island to identify themselves to outsiders. So for example, a Sabai man or woman is from Sabai or a Mar Mariam person is from Mur. So many Torres Strait Islanders born and raised on mainland Australia um, still identify according to their island homes. I'm just going to check in on everyone and see how everyone's doing. <laughs> I know it's a lot of information. All episodes are f like packed with information. <laughs> it's just like, I know you guys are probably thinking, God damn, Carissa, what the hell? But you know, I mean, let's educate ourselves. I'm, I'm, each time I'm researching for an episode, I'm like, 
Educate yourself, Carissa. Remember this. Like, absorb it. <laughs> and I do the same to you guys. Um, so we're going to talk about now community. We're going to hear it in um, the articles that I'm going to mention a bit later. So we're going to, to talk about community and what it means. Uh, there are many different perspectives on what a community is. In defining a particular community, consideration should be given to stolen generations where a community may compromise of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people may belong to more than one community, including where they come from, where their family is located, and what organizations they belong to. However, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, community is primarily about country extended family ties, and shared experiences. Uh, community is about interrelatedness and belonging and is central to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It is general, generally acceptable to use the term community to refer to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living within a particular geographical region. However, the diversity of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within that community should be um, considered where applicable. Uh, and this includes examples of mixed unions and mixed families. So when the term country is often used um, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it's to describe family origins and associations with particular parts of Australia. And this is most importantly the connections of bloodline back to country. So Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people have diverse relationships um, with connections to and understandings of the uh, Australian environment. Some of these relationships are based on the traditional knowledge and practice that have uh, been passed down from generation to gen generation. Um, so while others have resulted from various impacts of colonization. Um, relationships to co uh, country are complex and interrelated. How's everyone doing? Everyone still with me? <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's a lot of information um, that I'm throwing out there, but we just had a look at the background of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people and the appropriate terms to use. And as always, to be culturally sensitive and ask how the individual prefers to be called before making any sort of assumptions. Because of course we, we're all different and we wanna be respectful of each person's culture. So let's not make assumptions. I know that none of my listeners make assumptions of anything. That's why I love you guys. I hope everybody's holding up. <laughs> so as previously mentioned, we're going to look at two um, young women and the message that they're spreading and how they're changing the playing field. So we're going to look at an article that's called She's Created a Conversation, Magnolia Maimuro Ends Miss World Australia Finals with Chance of Arnhem Land. And this article was posted back in 2016. And it says an indigenous teenage model whose beauty pageant selection made international headlines has ended her Miss World Australia journey with Chance of Arnhem Land. Maminjama Magnolia Maimuru's story was widely shared after she was selected as the pa pageant's first ever Northern Territory candidate in May. She says, it's been a crazy experience. The Yol Yolngu woman grew up in Yirkala in Northeast Arnheim and was finishing her high school studies in Darwin when a model manager spotted her getting cash out of an ATM um, in 2014. So um, she initially declined the offer to model because she wanted to focus more on her studies since she was completing year 12. Um, but she debuted as a model at NT Fashion Week in 2015. So since being selected for the pageant, um, Magnolia has been juggling photo shoots and magazine requests. And she also has a day job as a sports and recreation officer in Yirkala. She said one of the highlights has been hearing about a school in Italy that had started um, studying Yolgu culture after seeing news stories about her. She says, I'm very, very surprised by how far my story has gone. Magnolia says, I have achieved my goal. I've got one country learning about another country, how we're multicultural and how all cultures are created equal. 
The pageant title uh, was awarded to Madeline Cow, who is a law student or was a law student from Queensland. And Magnolia um, finished in the final 10. But her manager, Mihalit Sangaris, this guy for sure is of Greek origin. <laughs> um, so Mi Mi Mihali Tsangaris is, um, uh, is the model manager to Magnolia. And, she, and he says, so sorry, that she was a winner regardless. I think that she's created a conversation with Australians that we haven't actually seen girls that look like Magnolia before on the runway. Uh, that creates more conversation about us all coming together. So speaking from the red carpet event, um, Magnolia's grandmother, Banpapui Ganambar, cited the word Batayunmiri to describe the 19-year-old's journey. In Yolngu Mata, it means competing or racing against, competing for things you have to show. Uh, this is what Miss Ganambar said. No matter what color you are, you can achieve it in the end. So Magnolia's grandfather, Oscar Whitehead, said that the interest her story has generated in places as far away as Italy has surprised him. Uh, he always asked himself, like, why she wanted to be a model. Then he continued to say, I have to give modeling credit. It's been very influential. Magnolia was uh, last week, so this is, again, back in 2016. Uh, she was announced as the face of a major Melbourne shopping center. But she is also considering going to university to study teaching or following in Mr. Whitehead's footsteps to become a doctor. In continuing with Magnolia's story, I found a more recent article that was actually published um, in InStyle magazine back in March 2020. And it talks um, about how a double ACTA winner Magnolia Maimuru is reshaping perceptions. Uh, and this was written by Rachel Sharp. So on the day Australia's answer to the Oscars revealed their 2019 award shortlist, Maminjama Maimuru, who at the time, or actually this year is 23, was oblivious to the fact that her name appeared. She was unaware she'd been nominated for the Best Supporting Actress um, WACTA Award alongside Oscar winner Hilary Swank and Ho Hotel Mumbai star Tilda Cobham Harvey, uh, uh, no less, as she was off-grid hunting in remote East Arnhem land. Uh, I knew the Nightingale was up for 14 awards, but had no idea I was part of it until my brother, Josh Bond, who's manager of um, a dance troupe called the Ch Chucky Boys, phoned me at 9 p.m. She went on to win for her heart-wrenching depiction of an indigenous Tasmanian woman treated horrifically by British officers in the early 1800s. Her screen time in the film, uh, that's directed by Jennifer Kent and co-produced by Bruna Papandrea. I think that's another, like, uh, Papandrea is a, a very Greek origin sounding. Uh, is relatively short but shockingly graphic. Even so, she's captivating. So describing herself as a proud traditional Yonggu girl from the Mangalili clan, Maimuru is the first to admit glitzy film festivals feel a world away from her hometown of Yurkala. Yurkala is, is a tight-knit community of um, fewer than 1,000 um, inhabitants, but it's famous for its artwork, performers, and traditional culture. The, the article continues to, to talk about um, Magnolia or Maimuru's family tree, which is filled with accomplished and often famous relatives. Uh, so her great-grandmother, Golombu Yunupingu, who passed in 2012, um, but Mag Magnolia has given the InStyle magazine permission to use her great-grandmother's name, is one of Australia's most celebrated indigenous artists, and her art hangs in the Louvre in Paris. So Golombu's brother, Galarun, known as the father of land rights, became Australian of the year back in 1978 after lobbying the government to challenge overseas mining companies seeking to exploit traditional lands. Their brother, Mandawu, Maimuru's great-grandfather, was Yothu Yindi's lead singer, while her father, Rawun Maimuru, is lead singer of prominent rock reggae band East Journey. His cousin, the much-celebrated Dr. Jeffrey Go Gorumul Yunupingu, was a nine-time ARIA winner and Australia's top-selling indigenous artist at the time of his passing. And her cousin, Rarui Hick, is an actor on Foxtel's Wentworth. 
The list goes on and includes academic stars too, such as the beloved grandmother and grandfather who helped raise Maimuru, a prominent teacher and medical doctor respectively. My family is quite successful at adapting with changing culture, but still keeping our cultural protocols, she says thoughtfully. So many talented Yongu people have made a pathway for us today. So uh, Maimuru, I keep on referring to her as Magnolia, and she works under her middle name. Uh, so the article says that Magnolia is keenly smart, polite, and utterly likable in person. Uh, she measures one one meter 80 so she commands a room as she walks in but ironically for someone who's modeled since making the finals of miss world australia in 2016 she didn't grow up reading fashion magazines i was more outdoorsy i like to hunt and go camping and netting with my family she says and she's recalling um her childhood filled with music dancing and play this is my homeland my home she adds proudly swiping through beach photos of Yerkala on her iphone the article continues to say that this is where she first met director Kent uh, on a 2016 Nightingale casting tour. A confronting script, in fact, she had to crop her signature long hair didn't deter her, nor did the fact that she'd have to audition and act in Palawa, Kani, a language authentic to the movie's remote Tasmanian setting, but not one of the tongues she already spoke fluently. Her native Yongu Mata, which consists of six languages and 12 dialects, is very different. Wow, it sounds very complicated too. The Nightingale centers on Irish convict Claire who seeks revenge for her family's murder by military officers. While not based on a real story, it's devastatingly true to the history of British troops who brought convicts to Tasmania, then carried out mass genocide to civilize the land. <clears throat> the final cut helped Kent make AFI history as the first woman to win Best Film, Best Director, and Best Screenplay at the AACTAs the same year. From the very beginning, it punches you in the gut. This is what um, Maimuru or Magnolia admits um, regarding the film. I felt sick to my stomach that if I was born there back then, it would have been me. But it put a fire in my soul to tell their story. Her next movie project, a drama called High Ground, set in Kakadu in the 30s against a backdrop of violent colonialism, stars Simon Baker and premieres at the Be Berlin Film Festival um, starting February the 20th so of this year. I don't think the Berlin Film Festival... Did the Berlin Film Festival take place? It probably did because it was before um, quarantine. Perhaps it's in her blood that Maimuru isn't afraid to tackle hard topics, especially those that impact her community today. Uh, my Muru or Magnolia last year says I dedicated myself to doing workshops on mental health and suicide prevention traveling out to talk to our youth there are so many children I've met with big dreams but too many challenges and no opportunities this is not limited to Australia but when you're a person of color you're born into a society society excuse me that has already passed judgment on you there's not much we can do but outshine it but how can you do that if it's all you hear and feel. I want them to be able to do something as simple as walk into a bar in the middle of Queensland, sit down and have food without thinking, why are they staring at me? Maybe I'm not wanted. I've had that happen to me so many times. She continues to say she hopes to spark change in a professional sense too. I really admire women like Lupita Nyong'o, Rihanna and Naomi Campbell who have broken through barriers in their own countries. There have been other beautiful indigenous Australian models, like my sister, friend, Charlie Fraser, who I love so much, but none with my complexion. I feel like that's always been the missing piece to my puzzle. For those of you interested, it says here that uh, The Nightingale uh, now is on Apple TV and High Ground is being released, um, well, was released at the Berlin Film Festival and it will be released uh, later on this year in Australia. But anybody, if anyone can find, I don't have Apple TV, but if anyone can find The Nightingale anywhere else, please let me know because I would be very um, interested in actually watching this movie. I'm now going to introduce to you uh, Sasha Sarago, who's a former model, and she's the woman behind Australia's first indigenous lifestyle magazine. So this article was written um, last year uh, on April the 18th. Uh, and it says, former model Sasha Sarago wanted a 
uh, wanted more women of color in fashion and media. So she took matters into her own hands and she created a lifestyle magazine for indigenous and ethnic women. So the article is written by Ali MC. It is clear from Sasha Sarago's extensive resume, she believes she can do anything she sets her mind to. It is this belief where she hopes to inspire other Aboriginal women and girls. Founder of the online fashion magazine Ascension and director of the recent documentary, Too Pretty to be Aboriginal, Sasha is a proud Aboriginal woman of the Wajanbara, Yidiji, and Jirbal clans and is also African-American, Malay, Mauritian, and, Sp and Spanish descent. As mentioned, um, Sasha is a former model and she wanted more visibility of women of color in fashion and media. And in 2011, she founded Ascension, Australia's first indigenous and ethnic women's lifestyle magazine, which was brought to life as a digital online publication. Sasha says the vision to start Ascension was born out of the frustration of having to import magazines such as Essence and Ebony from the US or the UK to see representations of women of color. However, as Sasha says, international magazines cannot capture what it was like being an Aboriginal woman in Australia. As such, she developed Ascension in order to connect with women of color from across the world, but making sure we have a very distinctive Australian voice. Sasha explains that the name Ascension came from what she refers to as a spiritual journey. She reflected on her own history and searching for her next move forward. She says she saw the word on a flyer for meditation classes and it immediately struck with her. She says, and I quote, I wanted something that would be universal to all women. We do get a lot of questions whether the magazine is for all women. Of course it is for all women, but I'm setting a seat at the table for women of color because we don't have that representation. Uh, the article continues to say that she grew up uh, between the United States and far north Queensland and she began modeling um, at age nine. She says, mom entered me into mod a modeling competition over in the States. <clears throat> it was because I was very shy. As soon as I got on stage, I could leave all my fears behind and have a big spotlight on me and wear amazing clothes. It just brought something out of me. Her mother, Sasha says, was a huge influence on her, being a strong Aboriginal woman who owned a beauty salon in Cairns. My mom had one of the first Aboriginal-owned uh, beauty salons in Cairns. Uh, in Cairns, sorry, that was my first employment, working as a receptionist, helping to do facials, and even going out to remote communities up in the Cape, teaching Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander girls about self-esteem and well-being. For me, it really set the tone of the importance of taking care of yourself or taking pride in your appearance and breaking down the shame complex. Sasha says that one of the aims of Ascension, uh, sorry, for Ascension and her involvement and encouragement of Aboriginal models is to break down stereotypes and typecasting and to open new doors for young talent in Australia. Reflecting on her own experience, she says that after moving to Sydney to pursue her career, she quickly became tired of going to castings for coffee or chocolate products because that's all black people can sell. She says that such prejudices meant that as a model of color, you're never going to be seen or never going to work as much as other models in the industry, and not much has changed. However, as Sasha says, uh, there are growing opportunities overseas for models of color, including Aboriginal people where diversity in the industry is far, far more likely to be accepted and embraced. She says simply, I would love to see more Aboriginal models. However, she recognizes that Aboriginal women and girls need to become more visible in order to inspire the young generation. This is the purpose of Ascension Magazine and a theme she explores in Too Pretty to be Aboriginal. That's her documentary. I speak from my own experience and hopefully other women and young girls can resonate with it. But when you don't see yourself reflected back at you, you might not have the opportunity to believe it is possible. You might like to dress up or like fashion, but can I be a fashion designer? I don't really see that. I don't really have contact with other role models. Therefore, is it possible? It takes a lot of strength and courage to create something or be something when there is not a lot of reflection around you or support. It's important because you need to plant a seed. When you pick up a magazine and see a black woman who is a doctor or a black woman who is an editor, you can achieve it. We haven't had, this, um, haven't had that in this country, particularly for Aboriginal women. 
In Too Pretty to be Aboriginal, Sasha explores notions of beauty and confronts colonial stereotypes of Aboriginal women. In doing so, she reflects the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women from around the country, even that of the Bachelor the Bachelor or Bachelor in Paradise contestant, Brooke Burton, who recently uploaded an emotional video on Instagram condemning people who often comment, you're too pretty to be Aboriginal. Sasha has a message for any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls. What is your heart's desire? What makes you passionate? What makes you get out of bed? What are your goals and your dreams? That's something that no one can take from you. Even if you're shame, just believe in yourself. So I wanted to look further into Sasha's documentary and I actually found an article in The Guardian and it says, um, don't tell me I'm too pretty to be Aboriginal. It's not a compliment, it's racism. So Aboriginal women are all too familiar with this phrase. In her new documentary, Sasha Sarago investigates the racism behind it. So Sasha says, I was 11 years old when my best friend's sister approached me at her birthday party. She asked me what my nationality was. When I told her, she replied, you're too pretty to be Aboriginal. A cloud of shame washed over me. Two adults standing nearby muttered, Aboriginal? In a condescending tone, which signaled to me that being Aboriginal was somehow dirty. I stood there humiliated. Until this moment, I hadn't known that I was the only Aboriginal child at that party. It shouldn't have mattered. It shouldn't. The phrase, which has been described as every urban black woman's angst, was the first sexist comment ever leveled at me. And the first of many bizarre interactions I, along with many other Aboriginal women, endure when announcing our heritage. Mostly, I am met with pure shock and often an onslaught of backhanded compliments. But you're so articulate and exotic. You're not like those other ones. What percentage Aboriginal are you? When you don't aesthetically align with the stereotypical real Aboriginal, you know, dark-skinned, living traditionally in the outback, hovered over a canvas, dot painting, people become suspicious and question the validity of your heritage. It would be unfathomable for someone to say to a white woman, you're so pretty for an Italian, or you're pretty for a German. So why do Aboriginal women have to suffer this statement? Good fucking question. Ugh. Aboriginal women are predominantly measured against Western beauty standards. Racially exclusive ideals, which it's assumed we endorse. People believe we're on, we're on a quest to relinquish our Aboriginality in favor of whiteness. Growing up, I was haunted by this phrase, which came, uh, which came wound up in the intergenerational trauma indigenous people inherit. Compelled to unpack this silent monster, I interviewed four Aboriginal women to start a national conversation. I wanted to use the power of documentary to address the discrimination. Aboriginal women face on a daily basis all over Australia. I wanted to help heal our wounds and educate others to the hate concealed in seemingly innocuous words. Sasha continues by saying, it was cathartic to listen to these four women's stories. Although diverse, the similarities were uncanny. In Dia Monet, a Wira jewelry model described her European features as a blessing and a curse and spoke of the ways her light skin affords her white privilege. Marlene Young Seri, a Gunai and Gundi Gundichmara Elder spoke of being labeled half-caste when she was growing up in the 50s and 60s and mistaken for other nationalities. Kristen Bonds discussed how she navigated between, between two black cultures, Yamatji and African American. The former treated with contempt and the latter accepted, a dichotomy I know all too well. Rachel Carter, a Gunai Kornai, woman was also told she was too pretty to be aboriginal as a child she's now a mother of two daughters whose blackness she wants to help affirm it was only five weeks ago that my four-year-old aboriginal daughter said to me that brown skin is ugly and she wants to paint it white because white people are smart and pretty she told me i think when a four-year-old child can say that then our society needs to make some changes absolutely fucking lutely it does no girl or woman deserves to be interrogated about her identity. 
It's her fundamental right to stand tall in her culture, to show up in a world the way she chooses. Aboriginal women are no exception. If you're asking me this question, you're questioning and fixating on my aboriginality, attempting to abolish or cast doubt on it. And what does this say about you as a person? In the words of Rosalie Kunoth Monks, I am not the problem. You're too pretty to be aboriginal. It's not a compliment. It's a racist, abusive symptom of colonialism. Aboriginal women love our culture. We love our mob. We love our country, which always was, always will be aboriginal. I'll continue to rock my aboriginal flag t-shirt, flaunt my hashtag change the date earrings, and remain black and deadly. And for all the Trevor Noahs of the world, I am a proud Wajanbara Yidiji and Jirbal woman. I am Giguru, beautiful in the Jirbal language, whether you think so or not. Ah, society, seriously, I don't know what the hell goes through people's minds sometimes and how we don't realize how our words impact someone. Um, and it's like the, the article we, we talked about a few weeks ago, um, Robin Trans, and how, you know, we, we, we tend to have, we tend to just speak without thinking. And it's one of those things that human beings are all guilty of. We most of the times speak without thinking. <laughs> So it says that NITV's Too Pretty to be Aboriginal is available to watch on SBS On Demand. If I'm going to be posting this, actually, um, these articles up on um, Spread the Love Friday. <laughs> and, um, and I'll also, if anybody finds the Too Pretty to be Aboriginal and the Nightingale, Please let me know because I would seriously, because I don't know, SBS On Demand, I'm not familiar. I guess it's um, m more known like in Australia. I don't know. Does anybody else know SBS Demand? I have no clue. Um, and Apple TV, I don't have. So if we can find those documentaries and movies, please share so that um, those of us who are interested in watching it, we can actually um, have a look at them. I would like to also apologize because for sure I did not pronounce a lot of the names correctly. And again, I would like to apologize. I tried my best. My pronunciation is, ooh, I know it's bad. And again, I would like to apologize for that. With that being said, we're at the end of the episode, guys. I know there was, a, again, it was a lot of information. Um, and <laughs> I'm always throwing it at you, but I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will, as I said, um, be posting the articles up uh, on Spread the Love Friday, so you can look at the comments section. And also, don't forget to partake in Spread the Love Friday. Any artists, bloggers, vloggers, um, articles, uh, petitions you want us to sign, organizations you want us to to um donate to put it up on spread the love friday thread uh with that i hope you guys have a lovely weekend let me know as always send me an email give me your opinion about the show about this episode what you thought about it send me an email at beauty unlocked podcast at gmail.com uh, and you will hear from me next week but i do have a little surprise in store for you guys so stay tuned as always don't forget to love each other love yourselves spread some of that sweet sweet love and i hope you all have a beautiful blessed and safe weekend bye wow <laughs>